Good afternoon, everyone. Councilmember Dustin Hill, as chair of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am joined by my colleagues to my right, to Vice Chair Byron Amos, and to his right, Councilmember Boone, followed by Councilmember Lewis, and to my immediate left, we have Councilmember Norwood, Councilmember Waits, and we've also been joined by Council President Shipman uh, for this committee meeting. Uh, we'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Second by Councilmember Lewis. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 60 yeas, 0 nays. The agenda is adopted. I'll now make a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 60 yeas, 0 nays. Those minutes are approved. Uh, committee members, we um, will we'll allow one more cycle to gather any feedback or suggestions for our 2023 goals and objectives. But if you could get us, uh, get those to myself, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I miss McMichael uh, by the end of this week or early next week, that would be great. Once with that, we will move on to public comment. Speakers will have three minutes apiece, and we'll start with Ms. Henri Jordan. this year and they bend their tongues like their bow for lies but they have not balance for the truth up on the earth for they proceed from evil to evil and they know not me said the Lord Jeremiah 9 chapter 3 verse the devices of the wicked and an expression of the certainty of divine retribution Jesus' will for me is to work with the homeless calling on Jesus, so I need a bigger house. James Griffith's fighting for me to stay in the house I'm living in now. The Lord created the income for this purpose, to help solve a future issue that will be facing America. When you promote evil in a person, you ask for evil to take over. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. St. John 15, chapter 19, verse. I have chosen you by Christ's appointment, not by their choice. They were taken out of the world and sent out to bear fruit. Jesus said no governmental officials should come on the property because we need full submission to the leading of the Holy Ghost. James Griff worked against Jesus' word, so I can't work with him. But Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is falling, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of his glory. Isaiah 3, chapter 8, verse. Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is falling. It's stated in the prophetic perfect, as if this future event were already a fact. We need Jesus to control us because we can't fight Satan without him. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. St. John 16, chapter 33, verse. Because the prince of this world is judged, the power of Christ to judge Satan and to overthrow his kingdom is not future, but as the cross and the resurrection. Christ says for me to start a church if you desire to ask him for how to help the people. We can't help the people without Jesus. Deceit, defraud, or mission for treachery or robbery is the way of the flesh that leads to death. We want the power to, not to practice those things, to give ourselves life and give other people life. Thank you for listening. Casey Sharp. Uh, Council President, uh, members of the committee here, and everyone who's present here today, um, I'm here to speak a little bit about the proposed APF facility in southeast Atlanta. 
Uh, the temperature has been very hot on this lately, to say the least. Uh, some awful things happened on Saturday night, and uh, some protesters did some very idiotic things. But while we have all of this uh, heat and media attention going around this, I'd like us to bring it back to some reasonable discussion about the proposal itself and issues surrounding it. Uh, my family goes way back here in Atlanta. Uh, I have family buried in West Youth Cemetery, going back generations, and my great-granddad was a police chief who escorted Clark Gable at the, at the premiere of Gone with the Wind at the Fox Theater. We go way back here, and I support the police. I believe that the police need to have a better training facility. But the APF chose one of the worst locations imaginable for this proposal. And if we continue as is, there's going to be more violence, there's going to be more controversy, but also it's opening the city up to possible litigation and lawsuits for many, many years to come. I'm a private sector archaeologist. I work on infrastructure for NEPA, National Environmental Protection Act. Um, I also work with ecologists. I can tell you on my end that there's so many issues going on here. I've read the entire 150-page report that was commissioned by the APF, uh, by the company Terracon. If you call the APF and ask them any questions about this report that they commissioned, they tell you to refer to the Atlanta Police Department or DKPD. They won't, ask, they won't answer any questions at all. There's no accountability there whatsoever. This site possibly has unmarked human graves, considering the uh, fact that it is a Jim Crow era prison farm formally. This would be very unsurprising to me in terms of what I work with. I work with graves and things like that in my job for private sector infrastructure projects. Um, I also work on HUD projects and related things that are very much like this proposed facility. Ecologists have brought up multiple issues with groundwater. Um, the cab engineers have denied the land disturbance permit for this proposal multiple times. If it goes through, there may be many lawsuits. There's already one that's happening right now and has been going uh, since early 2022 uh, via the South River Alliance. And I'm hoping to have a member from them come speak to you at a future meeting soon. Um, basically, we're opening ourselves up to litigation for a very long time, and this would be there no matter what we think of the protests, no matter what controversies we have about that. Um, the thing is, there were 17 hours of public comment on this, and most of the support came from Buckhead. I want to know why it had to be built there, where the surrounding community had no representation on the city council whatsoever. It was the city council that voted for it. It's a tract of land that the city has control over, but the people around there had no representation on it whatsoever. Um, I'd also like to address quickly the violence last Wednesday. It's tragic. Um, and also the kid who was killed uh, is seen preaching nonviolence continually in the days leading up to it. So people are suspicious. It's part of the reason for the rage on Saturday. I just wanted to calm things down, and I thank you for your time, and I hope to continue this conversation. Thank you. Juan Robinson. Council members are empowered to make policy decisions and to approve ordinance, resolution, and other legal legislation to govern the health welfare, comfort, and safety of city residents. I've said this before, but I think you guys are ignoring that. Um, um, so the legal assistant, Ms. Wasana Hammonds, you guys have a duty to um, fulfill, and it's not being fulfilled because we've seen this public safety not doing anything. And I want to know what's the, the purpose of public safety. We need to know the meaning today the public the purpose of public safety. Mr. Shipman, I'm so glad you're here because you appointed people um, to public safety and the public have no idea what are the plans to help the community become safe by dealing with the community and the police um, as a whole. I was out there this weekend, watched little Deshaun get killed. It's not the police fault. It's not their fault. But one thing about it, I guarantee that black mother ain't get a phone call, you know what I'm saying, from the person you appointed the head of this boy. That's what I be saying, man, about leadership. If it ain't your fault, make that call, man. Cascade Skate Ring, I don't care who, who vouch for Cascade Skate Ring. Cascade Skate Ring, no violence, is there every weekend they invite them young folks there. They hide the guns in the bushes. There need to be a police escort from Cascade Skate Ring all the way to Allen Temple, man. So what happened, I'm gonna tell you what happened before a lot get out there. There was one group shot the guns in the air and the other group thought they were shooting at them. They started shooting at the group that was shooting guns in the air. Little Deshaun was running and got shot. It ain't their fault. 
It ain't our fault. Father first had a little son ever since he was five or six years old. But when we decide to give money to organizations that don't give a darn, our hands can't be on them because it takes money sometimes to help certain situations. It's time to start playing. This boy need to start putting together a plan. We need a plan before this week out. I asked y'all last time. We need a plan, Mr. Shipman. What is public safety? And how does it plan to work with the community? Because they haven't worked with the community. Cascade Scary make enough money. I'm born and raised here. They make enough money to hire your APD, to escort these kids from Cascade Skate Ring all the way to that bridge by Anatom. Yes, they make enough money to do it. I'm not saying they need to be on a nuisance list, but we sure ain't finna get out in front and try to make them seem blameless. If you going to put yourself out there and invite these teenagers out there, we all know it's a gun problem. Then you need to have certain measurements in place. And the law department up here, y'all need to help get out there. Y'all listen to them saying stuff. Hey, the public need to know, hold them accountable. They're not passing the policies out there. We don't know what's going on. The public need to be informed, not when stuff happens, man. We can't be reactive no more, man. We need to be proactive. These kids are shooting guns early, and they dying way too early. All they posted it to be out. If you pass the daggone curfew, them kids as to be in the house, man. They'll be in the house. I don't care who don't like it. We losing these kids, man. We can't have it both ways. They need to be in the house. Yeah, the police short staff, they can't do everything. They trying their best. But Cascade, Skate Ring, and other places, if you're going to invite these teenagers there, have the police protection there or the daggone share. Oh, no, I'm telling you, MLK is a state route. Employ the state troopers. Mr. Robinson, your time's expired. Yeah, thank you. We need to do something about that. Jimmy Jones. Good morning. Not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world, put to shame the wise, the weak things of this world, put to shame the mighty, the base and the despised things God has chosen. My name is Jimmy Jones. I have an upgrading uh, solution company by the name of No Live Wristbands. What we do is we upgrade dysfunctional systems. This month is sex trafficking month. I know we have a lot of issues going on in the city of Atlanta concerning violence, but women are victim of violence concerning being trafficked. And the city of Atlanta, what we actually did, we created a query. This query is a document that needs to be implemented within the city of Atlanta permit process, the protocol for a woman to enter the industry is literally she gets her background check, so they make sure she has a clear record for her to go into an industry that could become very dark for somebody who hasn't had any key points on how to actually generate money in this atmosphere. It's easy to be lured in this atmosphere, and they're not asking the question when they go in front of the police officers that's matriculating them into this private set the enterprise, have you been lured into this industry? Are you being sex trafficked? We created a query, which is um, 25 to 40 questions. And what it does, it actually examines the mindset of a young lady that's going into this industry. She only has to be 18 years old. She qualifies without a diploma. She qualifies due to a background. She qualifies to generate more money than every one of you guys sitting on that panel, including myself, 250, 300, 1,000 years, 20,000 and a day at times in Magic City and Southern Sea. I've been to and fro in and out of this industry. I know I've assessed this industry, so that makes me sagacious. That makes me um, empirical concerning my wisdom and knowledge concerning this private sector. These questions would simply ask this woman, when she goes to pay, I think it's 270 to upgrade the task base growth, to put money in you guys' pockets and you guys' pockets, she's getting the safe public safety vow. This is a public safety meeting, right? So what we're doing is we're going to begin to protect our women. I need to sit down with some of the like-minded people. Um, I got counsel from somebody who's not in office right now, Felicia Moore, who has been very active in telling me the protocol and the process to actually get in front of you guys. So she sent me here today. Because of her wisdom and her knowledge, she's been there. She's done that. Um, I'm sure if she was in mayor, we would have already implemented this, just like the nightlife committee, which is necessary to actually put things in perspective concerning this private sector enterprise that's totally unregulated. 
evading the 16th Amendment um, taxation laws to hold nine. The city of Atlanta was smart enough to implement such a permit system to bring these women to actually generate um, not only a tax paid growth, but to facilitate the fact that the federal government has not figured out how to regulate this enterprise. This is the beginning of the regulatory process for these women entering this private sector enterprise. The Spage query, you can look it up. I expect to sit down with somebody within seven days. There's only been one person that has joined forces to actually communicate with me, and that's um, Ms. Keisha Waits. Uh, very proactive. I'm asking that you guys join forces, that we protect our women. It is sex trafficking month. We haven't covered anything concerning the sex trafficking issue here in the city of Atlanta, which rates top 10. Forgive me for going over, but this is the issue Thompson, that pardon. has to be addressed. Thank you very much for your time, and the time is now. Keith Lewis, Jr. Hello, hello. How's everyone doing? Um, my name is Keith Lewis. I'm the founder of I'm a Father First, and um, you know I know most of you guys are up there, so I'm here in peace. I would like to just understand how we can really put these plans in place. You know, Councilman Lewis, I know the work that you do, Councilman Boone, Councilman Amos. You know, I know you guys, and at this point, I'm just like kind of just tired. And you know, you know, Councilman Amos last me, he said, Keith, what you want to do? I didn't know and I still don't know. So I'm not coming saying I had an answer. I'm saying we need places to be able to meet these children. We need help with transportation. We need help with training for all the leaders that come that say they have the answers. Everyone needs some type of support so they can understand what they're facing a little more clearly. I think people have this whole, you know, I'm super mentor, I'm super this, and they don't understand that it takes all of us, you know, the police, the fire people, the community, it takes everyone having a very humble approach because right now the kids are running the city, the adults aren't running the city. So to see all the violence that's happening, to see the people tearing up the Atlanta Police Foundation place, it just, I'm 42, but it feel like we're in the 60s or something right now. And I would just really ask for a meeting to understand a lay of You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we doing it. Of course, it's, it's scary, but at the end of the day, we're going to die anyway. You feel what I'm saying? So we really got to understand, like, these boys are really crying for help. And it's going to take us. So we need help. Nobody going to have all the answers, but we know we need some help. So let's go ahead and let, let's help each other. That's it. R. R. Harris. Before I start, I'd like to ask a question. I don't know the protocol. Uh, we talked to Councilman Boone this morning, and we mobilized. There's four of us here. We had two hours to rearrange our schedule. And there's a young lady. I would like, if I can't, if we can't talk together, she has some powerful words. You need to hear from her. It's Ms. Kay Mitchell. And if I can just take one minute and she finishes up, is that permissible? We did all we could to get here to sign in, but we, this is the best we could do. So can I have one minute? She just had finished up the other two minutes. Ms. Harris, you get uh, three minutes. Okay, all right. Please continue. So that means she can't come up? Every, who has signed up? Ms. Ms. K. Mitchell, we were pulling up at the same time we, when I left, we left our neighborhood. So I'm just saying, we, can we share the three minutes? I'll be real quick, but she has some powerful words she's put together that what is needs her name? to be heard. Ms. K. Mitchell. She is not on, she did not sign up for public comment. <clears throat> Ms. Lyles is on there. Can she take her place? 
Miss who? Miss Ruth Lyles. Bailey. Bailey. Lyles Bailey. We're going to be quick. We're going to need three minutes, but she needs to, she needs to talk. I'm going to be real quick. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mrs. Minutes, Harris. You've got your 40 seconds in already. So okay. My name is Mrs. Harris. I'm a legacy please. resident in the Adamsville community. We were very sad to hear of the uh, misfortunate situation that happened at the Cascade Skating Rink, which is in our neighborhood over the weekend. We are heartbroken when we heard phone calls and texts start coming to me last night saying, what are we going to do? Another incident happened in our community. Uh, early Saturday, I had the pleasure to be at the Mayor, Mayor Dickens uh, Summit on Neighborhoods. Some of the major concerns was crime. We talked about uh, some data that indicated where the crime was. I almost broke in tears to hear how much crime is in my neighborhood and in southwest Atlanta. So that's why this morning after we talked, we got to come down here. In the Adamsville community, we are focused on uh, uh, partnering with APS, uh, City of Atlanta, federal, state, we don't care who they are, anybody that's, that's about having things done with children. Uh, the mayor's year of the youth, it needs to be year of the youth, but they need to be here to enjoy the year of the youth. Thank you very much for your time. Ms. Bailey. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mitchell is going to take that three minutes. Good morning, um, elected officials. Thank you for taking this moment to hear our voice and concerns of the Adamsville community. Our deepest and sincerest, sincerest condolences are extended to the family and friends of Mr. DuBose um, for, the tragic, uh, for the tragedy that took place on MLK. Um, and our, our prayers are extended to the family and, and friends as well. Um, if I could have a moment of your time, this was a poem that was sent to me this morning by youth in our community. and. It's, it's very resounding and it's very heartfelt. So I ask that you not only listen with your ears, but listen with your heart as well. It's titled, That Life. If you're about that life, this community ain't the place for you. We aspire for greatness far beyond your tunnel view. Garnering the attention of tragedies aren't needed on our Google search. An innocent kid or bystander killed by another, a family experiencing hurt. If you are about that life point of clarification, then this quote unquote hood ain't for you. We embrace higher virtues of effective change and equity. We have a lot more work to do. We have bigger goals and priorities to achieve, accomplishing milestones rather than addressing your acts of hate, violence, and buffoonery. If you're about, quote unquote, that life, your own tribe, you should find a place far, far away to embrace the lifestyle you want to reflect and amongst those of your own kind. We don't need your kind of shame to fame that you bring to our streets attempts to obtain street credibility through all of your evil deeds. Why don't you invest your time to become a heroic pillar or help to meet the or help to meet your neighbor's basic needs? We got work to do and less time to do it besides seeing tragic social media feeds. That's my time, you guys. We have work to do. We've elected you all Let's partner together as a community, as a family, and just for the basic needs of our humanity. To our, um, to our officers, we appreciate your work you do, keeping our community safe. We know there's a lot that's going on in the city of Atlanta, but if you can, just keep pressing forward and partner with the community leaders that are here, and let's try to make effective change, you guys. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Erica Charles. Hey, everybody. I'm the Erica Charles, the mother of Zion. Since the loss of my son, there have been several teenagers who have lost their life to senseless gun violence. Since my first statement before the, before the full council, I know City Council Member Waits has tried, but nothing has happened. 
Nothing has been done to save our kids, our youth. Midnight basketball isn't enough or isn't the answer. The mayor has had an event at the very Cascade Skating Ring that the 12-year-old has been shot. If we pass the curfew law or enforced it, we maybe can stop some of this killing. If the curfew late has been enforced on Saturday, that 13-year-old may still be alive, do the right thing. But I have something to say. If this our new normal, is this the new normal, waking up seeing kids on the news every day? I, I thought Zion was an example for somebody else's parent, but maybe Zion's story didn't hit nobody else. Just like kids, been, kids got killed with, prior to Zion, and it didn't hit me or my friend, though. But getting that phone call, again, knock on the door, it's horrible. It's the worst feeling ever. And numerous of kids have got killed after my son death. And it hurts. Cause so can y'all please just start by doing that curfew. It will mean a lot. Thank y'all. Okay, that concludes public comment. We will now move on to our presentations. First up we have uh, the Atlanta Police Department Code Enforcement Quarterly Update. Uh, Director Talley. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member Hillis, as well as President Shipman and other members of committee. I'm Daphne Talley, the Atlanta Police Department Code Enforcement Section. I think the last time we presented before this board was August of 2021, so thank you for the opportunity to allow us to share our efforts in fighting blight in the city of Atlanta. Today I'll be joined by Jeff Baxter, our captain, uh, for the for the section as well as Jocelyn Lows, our code enforcement manager. Today's agenda will include inspection activity for 2022, as well as a discussion regarding our efforts around the problem property uh, task force compliance resolution, as well as our objectives for 2023. So our inspections activity uh, for 2022. Uh, for 2022, our complaint intake, which means the complaints there or the number of complaints that were filed with our office was 7,569. Primarily, uh, these complaints were filed with ATL 311. Uh, we completed 22,453 inspections. Those inspections include initial inspections as well as reinspections and court reinspections. We were able to do that by increasing the number of daily inspections assigned to our code enforcement officers from 15 to 20. There were 715 courtesy notices that were mailed for code violations in the city of Atlanta. Addition additionally, 1,054 citations were issued. This was a 114 increase from 2021. We were able to do that by uh, adding an additional process server uh, to assist us with serving citations in the metropolitan Atlanta, and as well as using our sworn personnel to serve these citations. Complaints that we resolved for calendar year 2022, 6,248. That was an 8% increase from 2021. And next, I will bring in Captain Baxter to talk about the Problem Property Task Force. So good afternoon, committee members. My name is Captain Jeff Baxter, Code Enforcement Section. Um, so let me start out by saying the Code Enforcement Section wholeheartedly believes in the mayor's idea that we cannot have another Forest Cove. Uh, and with that being said, we believe that no Atlantan deserves to live in substandard housing. Again, with that being said, the Atlanta Police Department's Code Enforcement Section has taken a lead role in joining the Mayor's Problem Property Task Force, which was created this past summer. Uh, in addition to the Code Enforcement Section, other departments include the Department of Zoning, Public Works, Watershed, Department of Community Affairs, Atlanta Housing, and HUD. Through a proactive, data-driven strategy, the task force targets problematic multifamily properties to increase housing quality and ensure the dignity 
and housing security of residents across Atlanta. Since joining the task force in late summer, uh, APD code enforcement section has led five joint inspection details across the city. Uh, those locations are 532 Cleveland Avenue, 2980 Del Mar Lane, 2500 Center Street, 3540 North Camp Creek Parkway, and 60 Pasco Boulevard. Let me say that all of the data that we collect during these inspections when we go out as a task force, all that data is compiled, uh, all the violations, all the pictures, all the people, and that information is provided to our partners at the solicitor's office. Uh, they take that information and then they move forward with their actions against that property. And I'm sure when the solicitor's office uh, presents to you, they'll be able to provide updates not only on these five properties, uh, but the other properties that they're dealing with as well. So we start out here with 532 Cleveland. Um, the detail was back in July of 2022. Uh, the building was built in 1966, uh, and we found 51 APD code violations, uh, both interior and exterior. Some examples of those violations that we found uh, that you can see here standing water, holes in bathroom ceilings, uh, and places that were not properly boarded up. Another location, 2980 Del Mar Lane, Harvest Oaks. The building was built in 1960. They have 76 units at the location. 36 APD code violations were found. Again, those were both from inside and outside. Uh, and you can take a look there at the different things that we found when we were there as it relates to trash, rodents, uh, et cetera. Next, 2500 Center Street, Woodland Heights. Uh, that property was built back in 1970. They have approximately 354 units. And during our joint inspection detail, we located over 50 APD code violations. Uh, and you can see there from the pictures from there those items that we found. Next, we targeted 34, I'm sorry, 3540 North Camp Creek Parkway, Royal Oaks. Uh, that detail was back in November. That property was built in 1978. They have approximately 238 units. Uh, and at that location, we found over 108 code violations. Again, pictures of what was discovered there. Next, we look at 3540 North Camp Creek Parkway, uh, Royal Oaks, uh, and you can see some of the pictures there of what we found. And again, I just want to reiterate, we're, we're proud to be a part of this task force. Uh, it goes to the core of what the code enforcement section is all about uh, and making sure people have sustainable living conditions. And again, um, I know that working with uh, Solicitor Erica Smith as the lead, um, she'll be able to present to you uh, what has taken place since these details have happened, the information has been compiled and passed on to the solicitor's office. Uh, any questions at all I can answer. I'll go ahead and finish the presentation and then we'll have questions okay. for the whole presentation at the end. Good afternoon, City Council and members of the public. My name is Jocelyn Lyles. I am Code Enforcement Manager, chiefly responsible for the Compliance Resolution Division. We have, first and foremost, clarify one of the biggest issues in this city, an understanding of code enforcement and the effort of compliance resolution. First of all, there is no quadrant in this city that is immune from the highly hazardous conditions that we address on a monthly basis through a meeting that we have, a public hearing that addresses these. Let me address, first of all, how we prioritize these complaints. 
First and foremost, these complaints come from code enforcement for properties that have been abandoned. These properties are considered highly hazardous where the structure is open and vacant and various levels of deterioration. Let me say before I continue, the work that we've done has resulted like in 2021, 26 demolitions of structures, both commercial and residential. For 2022, we have arrived at the point of 95 properties demolished and another 75 properties that have been cleaned and closed or cleaned and cut throughout the city of Atlanta. Now, basically the reasons for these disparities, or should I say the difference in the numbers, is because of the changing of how the permits are received. Our hearings have gone on regularly on a monthly basis and most often never had a missed case. We'll say this going back to the uh, previous slide. We prioritize a complaint based on the issues of one, the proximity of these open and vacant structures to schools and churches, the age of the case, the condition of the property, whether fire damage, roof or structure collapse, and then finally reports of illegal activities in and around these uh, structures. We do an assessment first and foremost to determine these properties that are highly hazardous and how highly hazardous they are. Those properties are ones that are harbors for crime and these are especially those that we want to eliminate. We do an inspection. That inspection assessment is to determine the level of deterioration in each one of these properties, ideally to show in our hearing one through a detailed presentation, a detailed report that itemizes all of the deterioration and repairs that we notice and can capture on film. All these are presented to the hearing of the public and the board members in an effort to paint a picture to show of the, the needed action that we need to take against these properties. Once presented in, in hearing, a determination or recommendation of clean and close or demolition is provided. That is what we begin with. Of course, there are individuals that come to present themselves at the hearing in order to save their property or to suggest that they're going to take action against this property. And what you'll find, again, no quadrant in the city of Atlanta is immune. We'll go forward and to say, after presentation of this information, we have a title report that is requested now. Before I continue there, let's say that we evaluate each of these properties. If they are highly hazardous, we are going to put them on a list which is presented to a third party. And third party contractor, a, a legal person, an attorney, to do the title work on these so that we can identify the owners of record and any parties and interests that we're giving personal notice that is certified mail. We also have a manner of notification both for the news newspaper, that is the daily report here that runs two weeks consecutively. We have certified mail that's sent out once the title searches have been evaluated. And then finally, the legal notification, which would be a Liz Pendens, which is filed against the title, which is a legal notification to anyone who would have anything to do with changing of the ownership that information is filed against that deed in Fulton County Deeds and Records or DeKalb County. Because again, there's no area in the city of Atlanta that's immune. All right, so once this information is presented, an order is issued, and that order is, would be a demolition or clean and close. We go on then for further notification and confirmation that we have had this property in for hearing for both public consumption and notice and we proceed with monitoring that property after the hearing. 30 days after the hearing, we determine whether we should go forward. We have plans to eliminate the blight. First, you'll clean and close a process 30 days after the date of the hearing if that property is still found to be open and vacant. As far as demolitions are concerned, those demolitions go through a process, and that process requires certain clearances that are made. Once that order is issued, that process begins both for clean and close. 
and for the demolition properties. We reinspect those properties at the termination of that 30 days to proceed, one, to most promptly deal with those properties that can be cleaned and closed. Understanding, too, that those properties that were where a recommendation for demolition was made, that process starts at the end of the hearing. Uh, going moving to the order being issued, that order is issued and it is be and things begin. We reinspect for compliance and proceed to get the required clearances. Those required clearances go through the city of Atlanta and the associated agencies that provide our, us the permission to begin to utilize the public fund to take action. Now, permit issuances go for both the owners and the owners get the, their permits to do renovations as you'll see in some of these photographs that we'll have here. For this particular photograph you're here, you have north, southeast Atlanta, the property roof has collapsed. It had been like that for many years, as you can tell from the height of the overgrowth that's posted. The next slide, please. This property here is in northeast Atlanta. That property has stood for five years with a hole in the roof and a deteriorating center inside. If you'll notice, the second picture to the far right is a picture of the back of the house, which a tree has hit it. The people who owned it still live in the city of Atlanta, and unfortunately, they had not taken the time to correct these problems. It got worse. Trees, another tree had fallen on that house, and we get reports from the owners, I mean the neighbors. The next slide. We also have the clean and close, or clean and cut. In this particular situation, this is the clean and cut. And you'll notice all of the overgrowth that exists. <coughs> what occurs with this is this area is a harbor for vermin, snakes, rats, and also people that like to dump in these areas. And so this is our effort with this particular situation, an unimproved lot to make sure that it's clean and cleared. And the people that live that in neighboring areas in this particular situation at this particular location are free of the kind of infestation that we all want to avoid, including mosquitoes. Well, next slide, please. This property here is an example of one of the successes that the code enforcement effort has, has achieved through an owner who won with the top left photograph that property was presented for hearing. The recommendation was to clean and close that property and it was cleaned and closed and a lien was placed on title. You'll notice the first top two pictures is what was before. This is before the new owner got it, turned around and renovated the property. Now this beautiful structure that is, is very good, very nicely put up and clean and secure for someone to enjoy. Next slide, please. Finally, all of these are the achievements of a concerted group and an effort to clean up Atlanta. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Baxter and Ms. Lowes. And our last slide is just to go over our 2023 objectives. Uh, our biggest objective is to backfill all of our vacant positions. Uh, code enforcement, we were not exempt from the great resignation of 2021-2022. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we had 21 field officers. Today, we have nine. Um, as you can see, though, we're still continuing and we're committed to inspecting all of these properties. We have a code enforcement supervisor position that we're also trying to backfill that we need desperately. So that is our priority. Uh, next item is to introduce legislation to our, improve our 1987 housing code. Um, there's some things in our housing code uh, that we desperately need. Uh, one of the a calls that we got last week was the maintenance of swimming pools. So there's nothing specifically in our code that uh, addresses maintenance of swimming pools. Um, also, we need to procure a contractor to clean and cut abandoned properties as Ms. Lowes just presented. We cleaned and cut 75 properties in the city of Atlanta that far exceeded the number of clean and closes that we did. Uh, some of you may remember we used to have the support of the uh, corrections 
uh, to go out and clean and cut these facilities as well as the Department of Public Works. Uh, resources are limited there, so code enforcement is having to utilize our contractors to go out and clean and cut these abandoned properties. And lastly, it is our goal to get back to pre-pandemic inspections. We used to respond to inspections within 48 hours of a complaint being filed. Today, with these nine officers that we have, and even with the increase of our inspections from 15 to 20, our response time has gone from 48 hours to seven days. And that's just with the initial inspection, and it is 10 days for court reinspections. But I will say that we are committed to inspecting every complaint that is filed with our office. We have a great team here. Uh, we also have Mr. Uh, Lelene Parks, our management analyst, uh, who comes to work every day, who shows up and committed and dedicated to ensuring that our daily tasks are done. And as you guys know, our tasks change by the hour. <laughs> so I'd like to publicly thank them for their continued support and dedication in ensuring that APD code enforcement inspections are completed. And with that, that concludes our presentation. As always, I'd like to thank the committee for your continued support and um, looking forward to working for you, uh, with you in 2023. So if you guys have any questions, we are here to address any questions and concerns. Thank you. <clears throat> Colleagues, if you have questions, please indicate with your speaker button. First up, we have Councilmember Norwood. Yes, I just wanted to talk about the um, House Bill 434, which enabled blight to be one of the one of the elements uh, that can be used with eminent domain to take the property, get it to the land bank, and have it sold and have it turn into whatever use, whether it's affordable housing. And what I'm seeing, you know, having been down here for over 20 years, um, y'all do a lot of work. But we have got so many properties that need to go away. And so I know that the solicitor is not here. He um, has understood my concern about this. I know that Savannah, it's my understanding that Savannah, Augusta, and Macon are doing this. And, that, and my question is, have we done this? Do we have any properties that rather than what y'all are doing, which I think is admirable, but it seems to me that we've got to get to the root of if they are not good owners of property and it is truly blighted, then they don't have the right to keep it in, in my town. So I want it gone. I want it changed to other ownership because there are people in our city that do not care about the community where they own property, but they don't necessarily want to lose their asset. And we need to do that tomorrow afternoon. And I know I've got colleagues that can point us to a half a dozen big buildings in their community. So not necessarily a single family residence, but apartment buildings that are owned that um, we, it, I know you're just chasing your tail. So my question is, have we done it? And when you look at this many APD violations, how many constitutes true blight that we can say your time is up and this property is going to somebody else. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Council Member Norwood. So I can't say that we've exercised House Bill 434, uh, but what we are doing is foreclosing. Uh, the law department has hired outside counsel to start foreclosing on these very liens uh, that we do have because we realized many, many years ago that I think the example, the last example that we used that Ms. Laos put on the, on the screen was a property that we demolished actually early 2022 and we were back out there in November to cut the grass because the owner is nowhere to be found. And so one of the things that we have started to, to do is to foreclose on those liens and then move those properties to the land bank to hopefully get into the hands of a uh, respectable or uh, an owner that is going to maintain that particular lot. So is the land bank actually marketing those property, those places? How many of those do they have and how many of those have been resold to be put into productive use? So that, I, that information I do not have before me today, but we can provide that information to this committee. Okay, what I'd like to do is to have y'all, the land bank authority and the solicitor's office all here at the same time 
so we can go from beginning to end sure. because the solicitor's office comes and we don't get a full story. Y'all do your, your work well, right. they do their work well, Land Bank does its work well, but we still have got a city that every council district is, is um, affected by bad behavior. Right. Correct. So that's my request for this committee. Next is Councilmember Boone. Thank you. I would like to um, thank you all for the great job you all have done at Baker's Ferry near Cornell Boulevard. Um, you all have done a heroic job on cleaning that property up. So first, thank you for that. You. And at some point, I would like to get a status of the view at Harwell 62 Harwell Road the status of that property. But again, thank you for what you have done in um, on Baker's Ferry Road. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you as well for coming in. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, thank you for telling us about the solicitor office and Ms. Erica Smith will be coming with a lot of things on the back end of this. Uh, but the first one was about surrounding around Pavilion Place. Uh, I know uh, myself and uh, we took about 100 black men and we knocked every single dorm pavilion place and we uh, passed out flyers and we tried to pass our resources to each person that lives out there. Uh, we know we talked about it being 240 uh, units and we always think about four people per household, especially in pavilion place. So that's 960 people that could be, could be potentially staying out there on the low end, right? And so I'm trying to stop it before it gets to Forest Cove slash Four Seasons level. I grew up in Atlanta when it was Four Seasons. And so how can we prevent, I don't want to have to close down those 240 units. Uh, some of those are three bedroom apartments. I don't see any three bedroom apartments being rebuilt in the city of Atlanta. Uh, the, I, I like to, uh, when I talk to people about affordable housing, I always say the best, the most affordable house is the house that you're already staying in. And so how can we get in front of this at Pavilion Place uh, with all these code, code violations uh, for 960 people uh, who've been living in this affordable housing uh, place since I think we heard the 70s. So how can we, what, what are we doing to not turn it into, for, to make sure that it doesn't get to forest cold level because I don't want my people that are already living there to be bust out how, we, how we've done it there. And also we don't have the same exact money uh, with this uh, monopoly money coming from the federal government to do what we did in Pavilion Place like we did in Forest Cove. So what recommendations will we have for that? So, so first and foremost, that was the, the whole premise or the purpose of the task force uh, that the mayor's office put together. And I can say that we were out at, For not Forest Cove, I'm sorry, Pavilion Place, 532 Cleveland Avenue in 2019. And it was a disaster. Now, we returned in July of 2022, and a lot of those code violations that we saw in 2019 had been remedied. Uh, so the code violations that we, I believe, and I, and I apologize that I don't have the number in front of me, but uh, we collected or found 51 code violations in July. It was probably 200 code violations in 2019. So again, the purpose for the task force is to eliminate or prevent uh, the city of Atlanta from having another forest cove. I like that number that you just gave me. I can uh, literally talk to people about how the apartments got better, 150 uh, codes better over the two-year period. So I appreciate you for giving me that. Okay. Uh, just trying to also stick with numbers. Uh, the, the, uh, I want to make sure I'm also correct. When we talked about the, uh, the tearing down the homes, tearing down the houses, uh, I think it went up from in 2021. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I was correct. We had 26, but in 2022, it, the increase I saw was 365, uh, the increase by 365.38%. Uh, is that a one-year increase, 365? That's a one-year increase. And, and as Ms. Lau stated, in 2020 and 2021, of course, uh, the Department of City Planning uh, went from in-person filings of, of, of permit applications to online. And so the process took a lot longer. So uh, it, instead of 
of city contractors securing permits within 30 to 45 days, it was probably taking maybe three months or a little bit more to, um, to secure those permits. I, so I that, that is, that's the reason for the, for the increase. And I know last year when I came in my first year, we, we discussed my house, uh, the house I grew, mm -hmm. up in, grew up in being one of the houses that were torn down. And God mm -hmm. willing, God knows, I wish it never was torn down. Uh, thinking about the state that is in, thinking about what the community looks like now. Uh, to see that go up by 300 percent when we were trying to decrease it, uh, is, uh, is there anything we can do to see it go the other way? Uh, to see 300%, because I'm thinking about people like me who didn't want their house gone. I'm right. getting those calls. Right. So to see that increase by not 100%, not 200, mm -hmm. but 300 and 365.38%, mm -hmm. that, that's an increase in one year. When we had, a, right. when last year we talked about stop tearing down houses as right. much. Right. So, so it is, it is our, always our goal um, to have these properties look like the, the last photo that she saw we would prefer not to have a vacant land that will later become a haven for dumping and overgrowth because the community is looking for us to come back out there and put more money into that property by cutting it. So it's always our goal. So if, if, uh, if you look at the screen, and, and that's why Ms. Lowes wanted to put the initial complaints for foul. So a lot of these properties that are torn down, they've been in that condition for years. So we have been, literally begging the owner to comply the property, to either rehab the property or demolish it themselves. I mean, we don't want to demolish these properties. Our demolition costs $20,000 when an owner can probably demolish their own property for $5,000. So it is always our goal to engage the property owner into complying the property. I, I think that uh, I agree with you that the percentage jump 300% uh, is a high number when we, last year I knew we were talking about. It. And lastly, uh, just to help, uh, Wednesday I'm having a, a job fair. 1,000 people have signed up to come. Uh, we're going to run out of jobs. Uh, so you also talked about uh, your, the job uh, two years ago having 21 folks, now we have nine. Correct. Is there a way, I'm a numbers guy, is there a way sure. that I can get those 12 jobs at my job fair? on Wednesday this week, in which we're going to have HR there. We're going to have all these different departments from the city of Atlanta, we're going to have qualified people walking through there. Uh, what's the process of me getting folks who pull up on that Wednesday mm -hmm. who are qualified? What's the process of getting them that job? That's the one they want. Can you invite us to this? Oh, just got an invite. <laughs> we will It's going to be, be four hours uh, from two to six. Myself, I'll okay. be there entire four hours myself to make sure each person that walks in okay. is treated fairly and they get to an opportunity to apply for and possibly receive okay. a job. We will be there. All right. Is that Roselle Fan on Cleveland Avenue okay. on a Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock? We'll reach out to Mina and get yep. the, the information. I want those 12 jobs. I know the people that want those jobs, too. Okay. I'm excited about it. We uh, need bodies. And thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Councilmember Bakhtiar. Yeah, I was listening in. I wanted to run in real quick. And um, I miss Tal, you know what a big fan I am of uh, you and Miss Jojo. Um, but I just want to give a shout out because I know that you, I mean, we talked over this weekend and I've been trying to understand our vacancies and I want to give a shout out to code enforcement for having only eight officers in the field, but still being able to work, do the work that you do and finding out that your starting salary for these positions that are in such high demand is only $38,000 for a full-time position right. is absolutely horrific. So I will be doing all that I can to help correct that because code enforcement always delivers for us um, and we need to be setting y'all up for success. And I honestly do not know how you've been able to do what you do with such a huge, with such huge vacancy numbers, more mm -hmm. vacancies than you have field officers and for such little pay in a city with, a lo with cost of living skyrocketing right. every month. So thank you for what you do and I'll do everything I can to help. Thank you. President Shipman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Let me add my thanks for all the work that, that you do. A quick question. Some of the um, multifamily units, um, residents are the ones who are making the complaints. Citations are to the owners. Can you talk a little bit about potential retaliation and, and how we can make sure that there's not a retaliation from a landlord who's been um, reported by a resident? So we, we haven't had any instances where retaliation has happened. Um, you know, our focus is on the bulk of violations that we observe and in dealing with that owner. 
we, we don't break it down to tell them Mrs. Jones complained about this at this apartment number. We don't get into the weeds of that. It's simply the sheer volume of violations where we observe them. Uh, so with our eyes and our boots on the ground. And so we've had no instances of, of those types of situations. Good. Thank you. Recognize we've been joined by Council Member Bond. Uh, just have a few comments. Um, what is the update slash timeline on updating uh, the housing code uh, for code enforcement? We were hoping to have that done actually in 2022. Um, there are a couple of changes uh, that we may be making. Uh, there was something that we wanted eliminated that may not be eliminated. So we're still working with the law department uh, to finalize uh, the draft. I think I may have shared that with you. So I'm hoping by second quarter uh, of 2023, we'll be able to introduce uh, those changes to this committee. Right, Ms. Robinson will have that done by the end of the week. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the NREM uh, hearing, uh, what are some of the challenges you're having right now? I believe this month's meeting was canceled. Is it quorum issues no. or what is, what is the problem? So this one, this one was actually a, a new issue. Uh, so the title company that we use uh, to perform our title ex examinations uh, was not paid. And so because they were not paid, they refuse to do our title examinations. They have since been paid. We have since received those title examinations for January, but we did not meet the d deadline for posting. And then what is the, the challenge with, I guess, uh, wrapping up the number of properties on the agenda to try to, you know, I know there's already a backlog, and then 2020 and 2021 happened, and, uh, and I know we're getting back to having the hearings, but they s still seem, you know, some meetings we are, Right. I'm, not, I'm going to let Ms. So Lowes. Properties on the on the agenda. So. Okay. I'm going to let Ms. Lowes address that. Okay. Let me understand what you're asking. First of all, um, the backlog. We have the backlog of those properties that are pending demolition, getting permits, that sort of thing, and then we have uh, any number of items of properties that we have not even seen yet. So. Help me understand. Yeah, so, so I know there's a backlog everywhere, and I'll, I'll get to another part you asked here in a minute, but my question is when there are in-rim hearings and we have, you know, a whole long probably book of properties that are awaiting in-rim hearings, uh, why can we not ramp up instead of having, say, 10 to 15 properties on an agenda, ramping that up to 30, 50 or so properties on one agenda, so that checks that mark and then it goes over to continue the process. May be let to a contractor. Uh, they go through the city permitting process. I know that'll just add to that backlog, but getting it through the NREM process. Okay, we have a couple of, of items that we can address on that matter. First and foremost, the two inspectors that we have are relatively new inspectors. While they are not new to the code enforcement process, they are new to the process of compiling and completing the reports necessary to document the type of deterioration. Secondly, with respect to the numbers, we are required to notify uh, the owners and parties and in interests ahead of time. There are specific time sensitive uh, guidelines and deadlines that we have to follow. In order to do that, we have to go out to the property, determine if it's eligible, the title search person has to do the title search, and that sometimes takes some time. Then third, notification and evaluation of those titles to be able to fully identify and notify all the people on the list. So in, a, in this process, we are able to provide as much as possible based on some limitations that are imposed by ordinance. Is that good? Does that answer? Um, the so on, on our this is just a request, Director Tally. Um, we usually receive on our printed update. Uh, we don't get just what has been done, but we also see what's uh, pending, what's in the system. So if we could get uh, okay. that second part of that. Yeah. Uh, the ones that have already went through and had orders, we could get updates on. All of those where they're at in the system, 
um, that would be appreciated. And speaking of later on in the system, when they finally get to demolition, um, what is the current status of our demolition contracts with our city contractors? I know we lost one contractor a, a year or two ago. Uh, right. I think the time flies. It, it may have been three Probably years, years but, ago, yes. Um, if you could just update me on that. So the current contract uh, is a five-year contract is due to expire in 2024. Actually, we spoke with um, procurement uh, a couple of weeks ago regarding the status of it. So what we're going to be doing uh, this year, well, quite frankly, the two contractors that we have are doing a pretty good job um, with the with the caseload that we that we do have. But we will be this year working on a new solicitation um, to add uh, new contracts or new contractors or to execute a new contract for demolition projects. But it, it does expire in 2024. Gotcha. Speaking of the uh, people backlog and vacancies, um, I believe we talked about this before, but you know the ultimate goal is to fill those with city employees, but much like uh, DCP has done, sometimes we're going to have to go to outside agencies and hire mm -hmm. Uh, temporary inspectors from those agencies is that something code enforcement is looking into and if so what is the status of that and so we have and so we, we were actually looking into it specifically for the task force and so the the issue that we have what is identifying funding uh, for that and so I, I don't think it's it's dead as of right now yeah I don't think that's a, a dead topic I think we're still trying to explore uh, the possibility, but uh, late last year we were looking specifically uh, for outside uh, contractors to come in and do inspections for the multifamily um, inspections. Um, and I've asked this many times before of code enforcement of the solicitor's office. Um, this would probably apply initially to the problem properties uh, that's on this slide. Um, Wilden Heights been an example on District 9, Councilmember Boone's properties, uh, Councilmember Lewis properties he spoke about, but um, you know, of course the max fine a city can levy for warrant violation is $1,000 per state law. However, if we dedicate a team, if these are outside contract, mm -hmm. if we dedicate a team to do these, what is our history? Are we doing it currently? Can we do it in the future with doing per day violations and I know that takes resources to go out and lay eyes on the property because they have to see it every day to issue that citation and once they have been notified that they're continually in violation but that just gives us more leverage when all of the companies that own these properties are from California from right. Ontario etc right. um, to hold them accountable or you know a uh, $240,000 fine is going to be a lot right. more threatening than a you know $20,000 fine right and and we have done that in some cases and actually the fines for multifamily dwellings uh, increase from a thousand dollar per violation per day uh, to five thousand dollars per violation per day I think that uh, that changed in maybe 2018 2019 yes uh, this question is for I believe Miss Robinson Ms. Talley commented, uh, Director Talley commented about um, lien enforcement and collecting on those liens. Um, I know at least the former outside counsel we had doing that, I don't believe is doing that any longer. Does law currently have outside counsel performing these uh, lien collections? Good afternoon, Amber A. Robinson, City of Atlanta Department of Law. I will inquire as to the status of our lien um, enforcement and collections activities, and we'll be able to provide an update to you and the committee. Um, Thank as soon you, as I receive it. Thank you. Uh, that concludes my questions. We do have Councilmember Bond signed up to speak, though. Councilmember Bond. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for your presentation. I just have a question. Uh, are you all partnering with other agencies inside the city that have enforcement or even at the county level when you're making cases on some of these problem properties? Actually, we do for, um, let's say, for instance, there is a 
storage unit um, on, I believe it's Howell Mill. And so we did partner with Fulton County Health Services to go out and do those type of inspections because there are some things that they can enforce that we can we cannot when it comes to that. So so we are doing that with, uh, with Fulton County uh, Health Department. But as far as departments within the city, uh, as we stated with the um, Problem Property Task Force, so that is a joint effort uh, with APD Code Enforcement, the Department of Public Works, Department of Watershed Management, uh, I think the Department of City Planning, Zoning and Buildings Department, as well as the uh, City Solicitor's Office. So there are times when we are doing joint inspections, uh, even with uh, Georgia Power. If there is a uh, complaint regarding someone stealing power, uh, we will call them out uh, to do those inspections with us. So we are always coordinating uh, with uh, city departments as well as outside agencies for these types of details. And these 14 properties out of, what was it, 40 properties, is the task force focused on those or are those just something you're addressing within your office? This is the task force, yes. The task force doing that. Correct. So, I mean, how, uh, and I apologize, I tried to monitor the meeting before I came into the meeting, so I didn't hear all of the presentations, so I apologize ahead of time. But what is the next round or level to get to the balance of the properties that are on that list? So I'm going to have uh, Captain Baxter come up and answer that question. Yeah, so we're going to continue those efforts. As we move here into 2023, our goal is to have a minimum of one. We're going to try to get two uh, inspections uh, per month uh, of those properties that have been identified. Of, of that list of 40, it's just per month? I mean, two per month? As of now, two per month. Of course, like Director Talley said, we're exploring the idea of possibly receiving funding to be able to hire outside contractors who can then also inspect. And of course, that would double or you know, increase that substantially. But based on our current manpower, we're shooting for a minimum of one, two per month, every month, as we move through this year and the foreseeable future. Well, OK. But I'll, I'll sit, say this, Mr. Chair, and I'll address this to you all and those who might be on the Finance Committee. I think this is a case for emergency procurement uh, because we have residents of the city of Atlanta living in third sometimes worse than third world conditions and it's probably not even fair to compare it to third world it's a, 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 a that's a, casting aspersions on third world you know over the last 20 years uh, when AHA reformed its properties and people talked about oh you're moving the poor people out or you know you're you know, you're somehow scrutinizing or being unfair to them on, on the poverty that is in the city that was contained in their properties. But the real property then, real poverty then, as now, has been in these private, uh, privately owned developments where people that really have no other choice, you know, of, of where they want to live are living. And I know the constraints the department has had, but this really is an emergency. You know, if, you, if, if, if pe people are forced to live under these conditions, you know, I mean, we, we all have to do a whole lot more. And we have a pretty big reserve here in the city of Atlanta, so if they need to hire 20, 40, 60, 80 people uh, to get it addressed, that it really does need to be addressed because it's really the, the embarrassment of the city of Atlanta to allow those kind of conditions to exist within our city. So I hope that those of you who are on the finance committee or are so inclined uh, will really push that, F, uh, that issue this week. I mean, because, you know, just imagine how it is waiting for help. You're, you're calling about the complaints and the people you're calling to help you can't help you because they're severely constrained you know I mean we can do something about that and I, I think we should take every effort and you know use every recourse to to do so 
You know, it's just it's just horrible. It should not exist in Atlanta. Those. And then you know, you know, I'll, I'll say it if nobody else will. There may be a point where, you know, we really have to go after them with every tool that the city of Atlanta has. If people are going to be derelict, non-responsive, um, you know, property owners, it may, it may be time for the city of Atlanta to look at a ways within its partnerships with AHA or the Development Authority to see how to acquire some of these properties and just not to let them fester as cancer in our communities. You know, but I'm off my soapbox, but thank you very much for what you do. We appreciate you recognizing that and, and understanding our fight, and we appreciate your support. Mr. Member Lewis. Th thank you again for Ms. Talley, uh, for the stuff you've been doing. I, I, I like when you, that you always know what's going on in your department. Oh, thank you. My question is, when is the last time your department been studied for uh, how many people you need? Because uh, 21 don't seem like enough uh, to me. And, and I'm going to fill those 12 positions Wednesday if you allow me to. If you like the folks, we're going to fill those <laughs> positions. Uh, but how do uh. we, because I heard a council member Buns with the nice haircut over there, uh, talk about how uh, the, there, there, we have a big reserve. Uh, so. I would like to, you know, I know we're about to get into budget season, but I want to know when the last time uh, that, the, when did it get to 21? Right. And like, what was the population of Atlanta at the time? What was the business population at Atlanta? Because I'm a numbers guy. So I'm okay. just trying to see, because I know for sure uh, you might need 21 in District 12. You know what I'm saying? We need more <laughs> than one. And I'm thinking about, well, uh, and last question. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead first. I'm well, I so I came to the city in 2007, and there were 27 code enforcement officers assigned uh, to ABD code enforcement. And quite frankly, I thought we were stepping on each other's toes. I, I think a comfortable number for us uh, with the 25 MPUs uh, is 22 to 23. Uh, I think we're comfortable. We're able to conduct those inspections within uh, 48 hours, and, and in some cases, 24 hours, when we are at 22, 21 to 22 inspectors. That's, that's a budget item. I'm going to ask for four more, because if you're at, uh, 25 MPUs, each MPU probably would be comfortable with having one person that they talk to. And so, mm, maybe. And, and, and I, <laughs> there, there are a couple, what, <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Because I'll the, take it. Okay. <laughs> But I'm, I'm feeling that. And my, la my last question was on the business side. I have some, some businesses in my district that have burnt. They got the same issues that the houses have, uh, burnt out businesses and stuff like that. What do I do if, uh, like one of them in particular on Metropolitan and Cleveland Avenue has turned into a, uh, a trap and turned into a drug trap and it's mm -hmm. sitting on a next right behind our CVS across the street from our gen care. And I'm having seniors who turn in there by mistake trying to go to CVS pharmacy or a gen care pharmacy and are being, I had a senior actually tell me, I'm going to tell, tell the guy, I'm going to tell my councilman on him, to, on you to come up here and get you. And so what do we have to do uh, to actually close down these businesses? I mean, they don't exist anyway. What do I have to do to get you to come over and demolish that one? Uh, well, <laughs> you can always send an email. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to encourage folks to ensure that an inspection is completed to file a complaint with ATL 311 so that case can go through the process. Uh, as I stated before, it's not our goal to go out and demolish every single property in the city of Atlanta that is abandoned. Uh, maybe that homeowner or that property owner is not familiar with the city codes. So if a complaint is filed and we're able to go out and inspect it to determine what the conditions are and maybe issue a notice and or uh, a citation to that homeowner owner, uh, maybe we can educate them on the time on bringing that property into compliance. If they fail to do that, and if that property meets in-rim criteria, then Ms. Lowes will be happy um, to place that on an agenda and uh, subsequently demolish that property and file a lien against it. I think my question then, so to add on that, let's say it's already been through one code violation. Okay. It's a business. Okay. It's been uh, on the same amount of time period. Okay. Uh, what do I have to do to just this, tell is, you, right? this is a vacant gotcha. property? It's vacant. A, I, a business, yeah. vacant yes, business. Uh, yes, please send, send an email to myself, to Ms. Lyles, so okay. that we can uh, do a proper assessment. I'm about to get it for you. Thank you. Right, thank you. <laughs> okay. Mr. 
one follow up to be okay. clear. Um, you said you have 12 you're trying to hire right now. So there we have, I'm we interview. Because, you know, the issue of funding has been brought up. Okay. But my understanding is these are funded positions, right? These are, there are 14 funded positions, yes. Okay. Actually, yeah, 14. 14 funded and that are vacant. 14 that are vacant that are funded. Okay. And 10 of those are code enforcement officer positions. We do have six candidates that are actually going through background. We interviewed those candidates back in November. So fingers crossed that, fingers okay. crossed that we're able to get those six in. But again, we still have more vacancies to fill. And so there's that part of it. Mm -hmm. Other part is bringing in outside agencies. Where is that at? Is that something that would require additional funding or where is that in the discussion? Right, so, so the conversation of, 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 of bringing in third party inspections, I guess I should say, um, was to assist in doing more of those multifamily dwelling inspections because as he stated with nine officers, we can do one to two a month. Uh, but again, the goal would be to do, of course, maybe four to six a month. And so to do that with the current staff, that's, that's really impossible. So the conversation started around third party inspections was to assist with the task force on these 43 multifamily dwelling inspections. Right, but where, is, where are we yeah. at in that conversation? Cause... So the last, um, the last conversation that I was a part of was finding the funding to be able to do that. I think we said in order for the city to, I believe it was four inspections um, a month, or I believe it was four inspections a month, that you could probably hire four to six inspectors to come in and handle that. And so again, um, our business, an an uh, business manager submitted uh, to our facilitator of this task force the cost that it would take to bring in those four to six inspectors. So I think uh, the conversation left off is finding the, lo the funding to do that. Well, you and uh, the captain follow up on that? Sure. I'm gonna follow up on that too. Sure. Uh, maybe a lot of fire. <laughs> no, we don't need you all, I'm not that big of a fire, but <laughs> I want a lot of fire under someone uh, to get that moving. Ms. Robinson does have a uh, answer to uh, my previous uh, request. Yes, thank you. Um, the Department of Law has engaged the law firm of Taylor English in order to um, assist with the lien um, enforcement. Is this a new engagement? Have they completed any actual foreclosures yet? Or? Well, well, we will follow up with a more comprehensive report on where we stand, but we did want to get you that um, immediate answer. Understood. Thank you. All right. You all for the presentation. Thank you. Next up, we're going to have APD's uh, monthly update. Chief Pete. Good afternoon, uh, Councilperson Hillis, Chair, as well as all uh, President Shipman and all the esteemed council members. We bring greetings on this. This January 23rd, as we move forward with our monthly briefing of where we are with APD and crime fighting. <clears throat> so for this presentation, focusing on week three, um, as we've rolled into this new year of 2023, uh, we are certainly uh, pleased with the direction that our crime numbers are going, uh, certainly when we have tragic incidents like we've had with Mr. DuBose on Saturday night and any other issue when we're having a loss of life or a significant amount of crime. Uh, we find no joy or satisfaction in that. However, uh, as we look at our numbers that are trending right now, uh, we're actually at a 2% for this report, at a 2% reduction in crime. Uh, of significance when we look at our violent crime, uh, we're at a 24% reduction, and that includes our homicide, rape, and aggravated assault. So uh, we certainly uh, believe that our target focus as far as dealing with those who are violating uh, 
crimes without the city when we're talking about critical incidents. Uh, we're focusing in the right areas, but naturally we're not in control of a person's uh, emotions when we see escalating incidents that are taking place and other things that are leading to gun violence, but focusing on the problems where we're still looking at drugs, gangs, and illegal guns in the streets and how we're able to get them out of the hands of um, not just our youth, but any particular person with a weapon is, should not have it as our focus going forward. So we'll continue to uh, keep that momentum going as we're moving forward. In the same report, we're looking at the number of our property crimes. So although we were down 24% with violent crimes for the year to date, for the uh, year we are up 2% with our uh, property crimes, which, cons which consists of uh, robbery, burglaries, uh, auto break-ins, shoplifting, general larcenies, and motor vehicle thefts. And what we've constantly seen is when we look at our Kia and Hyundai, those particular vehicles where we're still dealing with the way of being able to steal them in the manners that have been posted on the uh, internet. Um, that's certainly still challenging, but continuing to work with those entities to see how we're able to get a resolution to those types of incidents. Moving forward as a 28 day pattern. So although those previous numbers are year to date, we look at our 28 day pattern. And as we talk about the 28 day pattern, we are actually property crimes are down 11%. Uh, as we look at it, uh, you're looking at the robberies represent 8% reduction, your auto break-ins 14%, your other general arsonies 12% uh, decrease as well as motor vehicle thefts in this particular report are 20% reduction in a 28-day pattern which reaches back to the end of 2022. Um, nothing different with the actual trends. Of course, there's a 5% increase in burglaries. The number that represents our burglaries are mostly the highest number uh, is really commercial burglaries. And so we focus on our overnight issues where p units are patrolling, getting information, knowing where these crimes are taking place and being able to conduct field interviews in those areas where we seek, where we are able to see suspicious activity. Uh, one of the great things is we always get information or calls from our communities when people are seeing things. That's important as we continue to grow our community policing model. We're able to respond in, in a quick manner to resolve those types of issues. Speaking of which, as we move forward in the next slide, we really wanted to highlight this burglary arrest because I just spoke about commercial issues, commercial incidents. So this one gentleman here, Jeffrey Jones, 13 uh, cycle convicted felon, uh, we were able to uh, find him on the area of Moreland Avenue. And so one of some great work by Officer Barton, one of our Zone 6 overnight officers, responded to an actual 911 call, got some information, looked at the video and was able to find out what happened and started doing his investigation right there on scene, was able to locate him and get the investigations piece joint um, linked in with this particular case. That investigation led to him being charged with eight separate commercial burglaries on that Moreland Avenue corridor, which is just south of Ormwood, so on the southern end of Moreland Avenue. Additionally, we were also able to clear up some of our DeKalb County South Precinct um, crimes of burglary as well in that same footprint. So he was certainly a, a busy person and it was good that we were able to locate him and get him off the street, uh, had some successful interviews and able to clear those calls. So uh, that's some of the great work the Atlanta Police Department is continuously doing with our officers and our investigators on the street. Likewise, so when you look at it, the next largest crime that we deal with is larceny from, larceny from vehicles, uh, auto break-ins. It's been a consistent problem. It's one of our focuses. If we can slow that number down, we can have a larger impact on our crime numbers overall with the city of Atlanta. Um, this is a case that we're highlighting where it took place over in the old Fourth Ward, Sweet Auburn area, 15 Hilliard, Hilliard Street. Again, we have to give credit to a keen eye, a citizen who's in the area, noticing the activity and called 911, and we had a very, very fast response from the officers that were working overnight. Um, that led to us taking these two people in custody, Isaiah Polite and Ladarius Vaughn, both of which were combing the street at about 3.55 in the morning looking for the opportunity of breaking into cars and stealing things. Uh, so. Again, on this particular case, we're looking at entering an auto, possession of tools to commit a crime because they carry specific tools to break windows out in a lot quicker and a lot 
Uh, let me say this, don't make a lot of noise while they're doing it. So uh, in able to get these people off the road, we know we will uh, have some better successes moving forward with what we're seeing in crime. And then here's another one, yet again, an arrest up in Buckhead, Zone 2, off of uh, 594 Wimbledon. Uh, this young man, Daniel Ingram, again, a convicted felon with 13 cycles, but he's out still at 3.54 in the morning, breaking into vehicles. I, I, I made an error in the previous case. It was actually during the evening times, very high, highly populated time. But this particular incident was 4 o'clock in the morning. Officer Valentine, Maxwell, and then one of our new officers, Pipinger, uh, responded, got the 911 call, got the information of where he was headed, was able to locate this gentleman, and then conduct a thorough search of the area, was able to go back and find the property that was taken and ultimately able to identify him and put this person in jail. So just that quickly, uh, that's three people that we were able to get off the street. A larceny from auto takes every bit about 10 seconds to break the glass, get inside the car and search another probably 10 seconds. Before 30 seconds hit, they're gone with the property. And so for an officer to respond, to see that and do those uh, investigations, conduct those investigations are critical. And certainly we always encourage our citizens, instead of challenging anyone, to call us immediately, stay on the phone, and allow our people to respond quickly to get these people into custody. That way we don't have any unfortunate incidents because of the trends that we see with larceny from autos. If you challenge them, oftentimes, nine times out of ten, they're armed and they will shoot. So we don't want anyone challenging anyone. We want you to call 911, stay on the phone, and let us come out and handle that situation so that we can keep everyone safe. Moving forward, uh, repeat offenders. Nothing has changed from 2022 to 2023. We're going to keep our focus and continue to work with the district attorney's office. Uh, we've had a great partnership, and we will continue that with identifying the repeat offenders and what they look like. So for this particular report, uh, 17 arrests looked at it, and the average age of those arrests, 44 people. The average number of arrests for those 44 people, I'm sorry, 17 people, were 28. And the average number of felony convictions were six. The unfortunate part is here again when we look at those numbers, and so we're trying to find the resources when needed, and then naturally we can find the uh, jails to uh, take them to if we can't find any other issue. Uh, one person arrested 62 times, uh, so evidently he's had some issues, and then one person was convicted of felony charges 19 times. Those are the challenges that we continue to see with the repeat offenders. Uh, we still focus and we try to remove them off the street as soon as we can. If it's a person that we can find resources for them, we certainly will. But when they're having those violent pasts and they're still doing all these violent issues within our streets, uh, we will quickly uh, take them to the appropriate jail to uh, move forward with that. Um, moving forward. Just wanted to share some of the great work. So this was one of the cases on January 15th. So we had President Biden coming into the city. So we were tasked with working closely with Secret Service and our state and local uh, partners around Atlanta. So we were able to receive him uh, into Hartsfield, Jackson, and get him delivered over to uh, the King Center and Ebenezer. Uh, it was a great event. We had a lot of uh, resources coordinated to ensure that he's safe and working closely with the partners again. It was a good day, a good event through uh, our community services division and those other entities that helped along with Fulton County Sheriff. And there next to it is another photo as we continued on the very next day with the King Day celebrations of uh, having the services, ensuring that everything went well, working with the entities over there and having that march conclude from Peachtree and Baker back over to uh, the King Center. So we've been extremely busy trying to ensure that we not just do the proactive policing throughout the city and targeting what we need, but to also have those community initiatives to where we're continuously working closely with everyone to uh, make Atlanta safer. Finally, we look at our Connect Atlanta uh, number, so we are still certainly heading in the right direction as we look combined together. We've had about 22,482 um, 
connections through Connect Atlanta. And if we break that down, of course, you see the numbers there. The uh, integrated cameras are 14,690 and the registered cameras for those ring doorbells and any other where they don't want to direct connect, but they want to be registered so that we can get information quicker is 7,792. And so we look forward to that number continuously growing. What we'll tell you is that it has been extremely uh, beneficial for us to solve a number of crimes having those camera uh, connections. We're able to get that information while en route to a call and after the call, we're able to get that information, follow up and solve these crimes sooner than later. And it helps us because now do, with doing this, we don't have to deploy a number of people going door to door and knocking, looking for video. We can do it right there from an electronic means, which saves us resources and time to focus on the actual investigation. So with that being said, that concludes the actual presentation, and I'll be open for any questions should you have any. Thank you, Deputy Chief Peek. First up, we have Councilmember Boone. Thank you, Chief. Do you have any information regarding the incident at the Cascade Family Skating Rink that you can share? So uh, nothing at this particular point, certainly a tragic incident. Uh, we have uh, gotten that case. It's assigned already and the investigators are scraping the uh, surfaces, trying to get everything that they can from video footage to any types of information and looking out for uh, seeking for uh, those who can come back and report what's happening. Uh, certainly a tragic incident, but we don't have any specific updates that we can publicly share. Thank you. I did speak with his mother this morning, Ms. DeBose. Um, they are residents of District 4, and I um, was able to um, just convey our condolences on behalf of the entire city for this very tragic event. Um, the Cascade Family Skating Rink is a staple in Southwest Atlanta, providing jobs providing so much support for our seniors and, and those that, that need assistance. Whatever support we can lend them, please assist them. They spend thousands, thousands of, of dollars on security. Um, I know firsthand because I work with them firsthand. Myself and council member C.T. Martin cut the ribbon on that facility because Councilman Martin wanted something like a Dave and Busters in his community. So whatever support we can loan to the Cascade Skating Rink, they are a Christian-based, family-owned business. The Adamsville community will be grateful. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be happy to work closely with them and uh, provide whatever services that we can. Absolutely. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, Chief, for all the service you've been doing for the city of Atlanta. Uh, it does not go unnoticed. Uh, thank you for being in my district the way you all are and cleaning things up the way you are. Uh, special shout out to uh, Mr. Watson, Captain Watson, uh, for all the work he's doing over in district in Zone 3, District 12. Uh, the questions I had was uh, first around 15 Hilliard Street. Are the uh, young men that were locked up, are they still in jail? 15 Hendrick Street. Hiller. Hilliard. 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 It was something that you highlighted. There you go. I got today. you. Now, 15 Hilliard. It was Isaiah and, because uh, we, we put names to it. Correct. I'm, I'm aware make sure of the uh, larceny to... from auto issue that happened that evening where they were able yeah, to put them in jail. Isaiah Polite and Ladarius Vaughn. I'm not certain if they are still in jail at this particular point in time, but it's something that I can research and um, shoot you a message back and let you know. And is there a way, because I'm just thinking about people that we talk to, is there a way that we can because we need to know some of these things. There are ways we can put uh, ankle monitors. Have we looked at putting ankle monitors and bringing back the program Mayor Reed used to have in which uh, folks used to actually clean up in the community, do real community service? Because uh, I'm just thinking about, like, I'm, I'm just thinking about how many people are just, uh, I understand no cash bail, uh, no cash bond bail, but I'm trying to understand just letting people go uh, and they're doing the same thing again. And so I would like to know about Isaiah Polite and Mr. Ladarius Vaughn uh, in the next uh, meeting, if we can. Absolutely. And if I could speak about the ankle monitor. So that falls within the uh, AOR or the area of responsibility of uh, Department of Community Supervision. Um, we've had those uh, 
conversations prior to. It requires funding on their behalf for them to get the monitors, to be able to adequately monitor them and ensure that they're just not putting an ankle monitor on a person, but not monitoring what the activity is. So we've certainly uh, had those conversations and we'll continue moving forward to ensure that we can actually track people when they're out on bail, probation, or parole for that matter, because what we'll find oftentimes, there's a crime, we'll solve that crime and we'll see that person and that person is wearing jewelry around their ankles and it's unfortunately it's not gold or silver, it's usually an ankle monitor. So uh, we certainly look towards uh, trying to ensure that they do that when, when they have that availability. And if so, I know budget season is about to come up. We still got a little bit more monopoly money left. Uh, if there's any kind of way that you can include this in the budget, uh, is, a, is a sample budget that Councilman Lewis requested. Right, if you can put in somewhere to where we can get ankle monitors uh, for folks since we're doing cashless bail so much, we just think about the repeat, people that just keep doing the same exact crimes. Uh, so if you can add that to your thought process, just give me a side, side note of what that would cost uh, for the city of Atlanta. And uh, lastly is uh, thank you for uh, protecting young folks at the, uh, at the job fair. So we got a job fair coming up at the same place that the young man Jamal Dean was ran over. And we think about the cameras being included in the city of Atlanta. Part of the reason why we even are as far as we can in that case is because folks in the community actually had cameras that were already connected to the city. Uh, my question is, as we uh, continue to have so many events at Roselle Fan, how is it that we can get police or the sheriff department when the city's having an event how can we get y'all to, to be a part of it as the people that are helping us with that? What do I need to do for that to happen? Because in two days we're having an event. I just got a call that said that the, we got to partner with the sheriff's office for my event. City council member having a job fair for city of Atlanta jobs. I got to partner with the sheriff department to make sure we control traffic on Cleveland Avenue, which is a city road. So I'm just wondering how can we, what we got to do for this to work? So what I'd like to do is have a side, sidebar conversation with you. Let's look at it, and if we get information in a, in a manner to where it's enough and we have resources that we can commit over there to help to the extent that long as we don't have any impact on our normal services. But let's talk offline and see how we're able to uh, support you. And, I, you know, I like spending that Monopoly money, so I'm, I'm into it, even if we have to look at hiring a, a different kind of police officer, because this is Atlanta. We have events like you just talked about. And thank you again for uh, myself. I marched in that Dr. King Day parade, my second year of straight doing. I plan to do it for the rest of my life. So thank you for your service and doing that for us as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chief. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief Pete. Uh, a couple of questions. One, I just want to echo what Councilwoman Boone said about the, the family and management of Cascade uh, Skating. They do outstanding work in the community and they need help and resources over there because they are providing a space uh, for the community to recreate and it's usually a safe one mm -hmm. of course we want to extend uh, condolences to, you, to the family of the young man who lost his life no, no one should uh, lose their life that young but I, I want to ask you a question about part of what you said in your presentation about some of the larcenies in the cars. I know I, I was a victim of this about six years ago where my, my Jeep was broken into, ransacked, there were valuable things there. They were obviously looking for a gun, right? And so now, is it a case where, uh, I know we've tried for years to try to get the public to uh, the clean, adapt the, the clean car campaign but are these larcenies occurring whether the car is clean or not? Is it just the MO of uh, these groups trying to search for weapons? What, what's the trend? So to an extent, I'll say yes. Although a person can have a completely clear, clean car and they still be the victim. And the simple fact is, is because they're going into that car looking. And the challenge has been over the years, um, if you look at 10 cars, if that one is clean, but nine other have some type of value, then it's worth their time to go through those cars and look for it. The goal is, is if we as a community, we, including the police department as a community, would clear those cars out. If you spent 
10 minutes going through the parking lot and everything you came up with was empty, you'd have to find something else to do other than breaking the cars. But the fact is, they're still finding items. And so we have to continue to uh, push the clean car campaign to every individual. Um, I don't, I've been a victim as well. Uh, they didn't get anything, but they, they broke, damaged my door. I had to fix it, but I, they didn't get anything. And so that's the goal. When you continuously do it and you're coming up empty, you're going to have to find something else to do. Meanwhile, what we'll do is continue to investigate those, and we've been extremely successful with making a number of arrests, and we'll continue. Uh, we we'll have to find those other proactive things and to redirect that attention so that they're not out there on the street committing crimes and breaking into cars. And that goes from our youth as well as our elderly people who are out on the street committing crimes. I wanted to kind of piggyback on something that Councilman Lewis said as well about uh, the, the high rate of recidivism of these individuals getting out of the jail. You know, it's, it's not necessarily people getting out of our jail even though we have probably the worst bail reform law in the nation, or if not the world. And uh, I've been reassured many times from folks inside the court that they're working on a solution uh, for it. But a lot of these individuals are getting let go on the state level, at the state court, uh, because they're charged with felonies. So they wouldn't be coming to our jail anyway, right? So it, it, it calls for yet another conversation with our judges when they are setting the bonds or allowing people to to get out that might seem nonviolent because it's only a property crime. But if you got a record, you know, three miles long, you know, there ought to be more consideration given to allowing that person to get back out, partic particularly if they have a pattern, you know, of, of doing this type of that, that crime is their career, you know, crime is their career. But I, I have a question it's really for Ms. Robinson. Uh, Chief Pete, this is about the uh, the success that we're having with, you know, adapting our ring program, our camera program with communities and neighborhoods. Can the city of Atlanta require that all new housing construction, or whether it's uh, single family homes, multifamily homes, or even in some cases probably multifamily units or even towers, can we require them uh, as new construction to be uh, link to our system? Is that something that we can require? Good, good afternoon, Amber A. Robinson, City of Atlanta Department of Law. The Department of Law does not believe so, no. Um, there are certain requirements we can place on, from a building code standpoint on commercial properties regarding ensuring that they are camera ready. And I believe that that council did in fact pass that legislation um, last year or last term. However, to require residential properties or um, to link into our system, we do not believe that we would have the legal ability to do that, no. no. I'm glad that we're having the success that we're actually having because I'm sure it has made a tremendous difference in the way that you all are able to pursue and capture those who are breaking our laws and victimizing our, our citizens. And I just want to wish you more success with it. We thank you for that. Uh, we're certainly pushing it out and we thank you all for your support as well in getting the message out there. We will continue and each time we're able to integrate a camera or register a camera, it's a plus for the city of Atlanta. So we thank you for that. Thank you. I withdraw. Thank you, Deputy Chief Pete. Colleagues, that conclude your questions for the Deputy Chief. Thank you. Last presentation, but certainly not least, is Atlanta Fire Rescue Department's quarterly report. Chief Smith. Good afternoon, Chairman Hillis, Council Members. Uh, Happy New Year to you all. It's my pleasure to be here today to present the quarterly update for Atlanta Fire Rescue. Uh, my name is Rod Smith and I am the Fire Chief for the City of Atlanta. 